Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, can you uh, confirm that you can hear me? I forgot to press the... Yes, you can. Oh, great. Thanks. Okay, welcome. Uh, so I'm uh, Michael Obdenacker. I'm going to talk about, um, give you an introduction to Embedded Linux, um, in case you're new to that. And a, a great platform to get started with is a new one, which is called RISC-5. Actually, I'm getting a bit confused with the um, the mix of uh, uh, Roman and Arabic characters. So I could have I could have said this instead, which makes me a little more comfortable uh, being consistent with the Risk Five naming scheme. So. Um, I have to do one thing. You know the time is limited to XLV minutes uh, today. So um, the first, before I, I go ahead and start uh, the presentation, I have lots of things to do in 45 minutes. Uh, and because I want to keep 15 minutes for questions as well. So um, let me uh, quickly go ahead and, and build a tool chain for this work. So I go there. So the, I need to uh, build a tool chain to compile everything from scratch. So I'm going to go to buildroot.org, uh, download the latest version. Oh, that's the latest version. Well, I haven't tested it yet, so I may play it safe. So it was released like today, uh, very nice. Uh, so let's go to the risk five directory, the W get. Uh, so I'm going to take the one, uh, from August actually, because I, that's the one I tested. There we are. So we, ex we extract it. Uh, I'll repeat this, um, I run make menu config. And uh, Bitroot is a nice tool to um, to generate a root file system, but also a tool chain. So that's nice. So let's go and select Risk Five as a target architecture. And essentially, the only thing I want to tweak is the target C library. I'll explain that too. So you see, it's going to be GCC nine uh, for the compiler, and I'm going to choose my C library, you can see that only Muscle and GDPC are, support, are supported at that time. Muscle is a small a C library for embedded. I'll cover that in the slides. Right. And since time matters, I'm going to run time make, uh, time make SDK. In case you know that, don't know that in Bitroot, it's a command that's sufficient to run, uh, to create a toolchain. So let's see if it starts. There we are. I hope it's doing the right thing for the right architecture. Okay, now I can get back to the lectures. So, so I'm Michael Tanker. I'm the founder uh, of one of the companies sponsoring this event. Uh, we are focused, we are, we are, are um, only focusing on embedded Linux um, and uh, low-level um, plumbing for, for Linux. Um, so uh, everything that's low-level enough uh, that works on all, architect uh, on all architectures, not, not on all architectures, but that's, that, that can serve, um, that can be useful to make Linux work on any kind of product, essentially. So the Linux kernel, the bootloaders, the tools to make uh, and the root file systems for embedded Linux, such as the Yocto project and, and Bitroot, we, which we contribute to. Myself, I am a, um, a contributor to Free Software 2. I'm the current maintainer of the Elixir cross referencer, which uh, you may know it's a, a handy way to browse the Linux kernel sources, but also uh, the U boot sources and many other projects, which are essentially in C and C. So don't hesitate to try it out. Actually, I, I'll show some link to it during the slides. And I'm also the co-author of the Bootlins, uh, Bootlins um, 
freely available embedded Linux uh, and kernel training materials that you can find in there. And in a much um, earlier life, I was also the maintainer of GNU Typist. Uh, still, it's still available, and it's a nice way to learn about uh, typing fast. Not only speaking fast, but typing fast. Typing faster than you can speak. Um, so let's start with the introduction. Uh, why embedded Linux? In case you're new to it. Oops. No, no, that this way. I have to move the camera. So Linux is perfect for um, uh, to operate device with devices with a fifth set of features. So unlike on the desktop, um, Linux, which uh, I mean, the, you know that the Linux desktop hasn't uh, really um, uh, taken up uh, taken off yet, but um, I, at least in the embedded space, it's almost everywhere. Like it's. Uh, uh, like almost 99% dominance, uh, it's it's really ubiquitous. So um, it's it's nice to uh, to to study it and understand it. And the good thing about the nice thing about embedded Linux is that it's very easy to learn. Uh, unlike unlike Linux itself, which uh, if you uh, approach it from the angle of distribution, it's very complex. There are so many files, but embedded Linux is so much simpler. You can uh, just drop the programs and libraries that you need. Um, and see how simple the system can be. So you can understand the usefulness of each file in your uh, file system, and that's what I like in embedded Linux. Another thing is uh, the Linux kernel itself is standalone, uh, so it's easy to, uh, to to study too with that respect. There are no complex dependencies against external software, and all the code is in C, so um, let's just get the code. Uh, if you have a question, just uh, grab, uh, browse, um, use the uh, editors, and, and you'll find um, the, the, any, any piece of source code that you need because, again, the kernel is standalone. So don't be afraid of the kernel either. Uh, Linux is nice, too, because it can work with just a few megabytes of uh, RAM and storage. There's a new version of Linux every two to uh, three months. And the uh, development community is still relatively small. And if you participate to the community, you end up meeting uh, lots of familiar faces in the conferences, like, like this one. Unfortunately, I can't see your faces. Uh, but if you go to uh, the, the real life ones, uh, I hope that would be possible soon again, uh, you, you end up meeting the same people over and over again. And it's, it's like a really a, um, a feeling of community. And uh, you have many opportunities to um, become a contributor to the Linux kernel, to bootloader, to the build systems. And there's funding available too, like uh, some customer company, some people using, some companies using Linux uh, are, are supporting uh, the contributors to the to, to the, those projects, such, such as we get, uh, at Bootin, we get funding for um, maintaining some uh, SOCs in the, mainline, in the mainline Linux kernel, because it's for everyone's best interest anyway. Oops, sorry. Uh, so actually, this presentation is actually an idea to uh, revive an older presentation, uh, which I made uh, 15 years ago. Um, and it was called uh, Embedded Linux from Scratch in 40 Minutes. So I, I took the liberty to add five minutes to the presentation because I have a little extra time here. Uh, and this that presentation was actually um, showing um, the, the boot of a Linux 2.6 kernel on an emulated uh, ARM board for people who don't have uh, some uh, hardware readily available. The, the name of our company was uh, Free Electrons at that time. And this one of the, it was one of the most downloaded presentations at that time. So I'm gonna try to, to try that again. So uh, it's also an opportunity to see a few changes that happened since 2015. Um, so in the embedded environment, you have the maker movement. That's definitely new. Um, you have much cheaper development boards. Uh, before, uh, they were uh, 500 euros uh, or more, uh, thousands of uh, euros or dollars. And now you have very attractive ones in the range of 50 to 100 bucks. So that's uh, that makes um, that makes uh, the, the hardware ava uh, available and affordable for everyone. Um, I should also say that um, there's uh, we have observed the rise of open hardware, like Arduino, Bone Black, uh, to name a few. 
Um, so the, that hardware is actually uh, created in, in an open way as, as a software, so people can contribute to it, they can make derivatives. That also is boosting uh, the progress in that area. And something is new too, which is new too, is the risc fab which is a new open source hardware instruction set architecture. So that's, that's what we are going to use in this, um, during this presentation. Uh, on, the, on the software side, you have the Linux kernel that has made progress, of course, from 2.6.x to 5.x, 5.10 now almost. Um, Git has appeared as well. Oh, it was just starting in 2015, in 5. Uh, Linux is now everywhere. As I said, you have no money to convince customers to use it. And it's, and it's also um, getting easier and easier to convince um, them that, that done to fund contributions to the official version. So that's, we, we, um, as, uh, as Bootlin has evolved in the, um, in the, from, the, from the first years to the more recent years, we've seen uh, at the beginning we had to convince people to use Linux. And now we just, uh, it's, 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 it's even getting now easier and easier to get the customers to fund uh, the, uh, the improvements in the official versions of Linux. So we're making very nice progress here. It's though it's still a challenge, like, uh, but people, more and more people understand the value of uh, participating to the mainline versions of Linux. Uh, there's also, uh, it's, um, it's uh, less uh, visible, but there's the advent of Dev, DevTempFS. Uh, some of you may remember the, all the stories with DevFS and things like that, that was like, uh, a, a monster and a much cleaner solution it was created to automatically create the device files. So it's, it makes your life easier as a, an embedded developer. On ARM and other architectures, you now have devices that are described by the device tree instead of, you, instead of using C code. So that the device tree is a new thing um, and really helped to um, the, with the adoption of, on, uh, on Linux, on, of Linux on the ARM hardware. And there are, of course, many more changes. It's, it would be difficult to, to go through them all, of course. Oops, sorry, I clicked twice. So uh, a, few, a few words about uh, the RISC-V uh, instruction set architecture. It's, uh, it's new. I'm gonna not, not going to talk in detail about it. Uh, I'm going to give you a great uh, present, uh, re reference to Drew's presentation, Hydro, uh, at the end, uh, which is much more exhaustive um, here, the goal is, is rather to, to show you how you can, you can start using it, uh, experiment with it. So uh, just we'll focus on the technical aspect of, of things rather than the whole, having the whole picture about Rex 5. And this, this is still a presentation about embedded Linux, uh, mostly. So that, that's a new instruction set architecture that was um, created by the University of California, Berkeley, UCB in a world uh, that's dominated, dominated by proprietary ISAs uh, with heavy royalties to pay, like uh, ARM or x86. So even if you are just making the chip uh, completely by yourself, uh, but using uh, the ARM instruction set, you still get, need to get a license from uh, ARM. So um, it, it exists in uh, various flavors, 3264 and 128-bit uh, variants, and it supports small microcontrollers to very powerful uh, server hardware, so it's it's really really likely that we'll have like uh, PC-like hardware um, with based on Risk Five in the next years. I hope I hope for that at least. So anyone can use uh, the ISA to create uh, your own SOC and CPUs. This reduces cost and promotes co uh, collaboration. So you you can have both um, proprietary and open source implementations. Um, it's you have an open specification. People can use that to make proprietary stuff or open stuff. So it's good because uh, precisely free implementations are being created. But in the meantime, you have proprietary implementations that are that are uh, available now, such as the ones from uh, Microchip, Western Digital, NVIDIA. So it's interesting to see both. Uh, let me quickly check if my, yeah, the tool chain is still building. It's supposed to take like 22 minutes to run. So here it's building GCC essentially, uh, most probably. So how to get your hands on uh, RISC-V hardware? Um, that's something new this year. You have like more, um, some hardware available. 
So th that here's what's currently available. The the, the newest one, uh, the new kit, kit on the block is the icicle icicle kit uh, from Microchip with the Polofire SOC. So and an FPGA with a nice number of gates. So you can get one uh, from Crowd Supply at 500 bucks essentially. That's, so that's the icicle kit. Looks very nice. Um, so it's based on a, a RISC V CPU from Microchip. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, like the cheaper ones, you can the cheapest ones you can get the, uh, some boards that are based on the Candrite K210 uh, SOC, like uh, this Sidepeed um, MAI. MAIX bit uh, that costs 13 USD at <laughs> Seed Studio, so it's really uh, really attractive. It's now supported by the mainline uh, Linux 5.8 kernel, but it it supports it's limited because the the MMU cannot be supported by Linux. It's a too special kind of MMU. You can also so that's the that's the that's the one you can get. So it's yeah again it's supported by the mainline kernel. You have a everything you need, so you can you can uh, get it and boot it. Uh, again, you'll see more ref references on. Uh, Drew's presentation. You can also synthesize RISC-V cores on programmable logic uh, FPGAs. So um, there are some many references in the course talk about that, uh, how to how to do that, um, especially how to leverage open source uh, cores uh, and and synthesize them on RISC-V uh, on a, on an FPGA. So before more hardware is available next year, and actually Drew teased, teased us a bit at the last MIDI Linux conference. Uh, so keep on um, listening for announcements. And um, at least now you can, even without waiting to get uh, one of those uh, boards, um, you can right away start uh, get started with the QM emulator, which actually simulates uh, a virtual board. Uh, it's actually called a Vertio. Oh, sorry, Vert, and it's based on Vert IO hardware. So Vert IO is not trying to emulate a real hardware. Um, it just implements the functionality of the hardware without the overhead of implementing that, uh, of of implementing real hardware. So that's the latest solution in terms of CPU. Uh, you can also try it by with uh, JS Linux, by the way, uh, from uh, Fabrice Bellard, who's uh, the author of um, of QMU, by the way. So you could try this one if you want, like uh, X window. Why not? No, well, it is yes, let's do that. So this is really nice. JS Linux, in case you don't know, uh, is actually an implement a, a virtual machine implemented in JavaScript. <laughs> so it runs in your browser. So here we're going to emulate um, an X, uh, a Rix five platform on your browser, as as unbelievable as it can be. So here it's probably booting. Ah, yes, OK. I, 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 I didn't anticipate that my PC is also busy um, compiling a tool chain. So that's why it's slower than usual. Hey, there you are. That's, so that's, that's an X, X desktop, actually. Uh, I'm afraid I selected the virtual keyboard, so let me select. Yeah, <laughs> let me select the terminal too. Uh, was too quick. Yeah, there we are. All this is emulated in your browser. That's beautiful. So you name and say. So oh. there you are. Rix 5, 64. That worked. OK, so I, I, I stopped this because I, I'm slowing down the generation of my tool chain otherwise. So, so what, what we're going to build today is the cross-compiling tool chain with BuildRoad. So that's, that's ongoing. We're going to build uh, the firmware that actually kicks is used to kickstart the operating system. We're going to use Open SBA, SBI, and then the latest Linux kernel. Why not? But it's not. It's not because uh, there's a feature that's needed in that one. It's just I want to stay uh, as current as possible, and this just works. And the latest version of BusyBox, which is which will implement the routines that we run uh, in the root file system, and that should fit in 45 minutes. So let's let's see this. 
uh, a bit of theory while the tool chain is um, building. So essentially, we uh, in the, the reminder of the talk, I'm, I'm going to use the words host and targets. Uh, so the host is the PC, the development PC, which contains all the development tools, and especially the, the tool chain to, to, uh, to create, to compile and debug the, uh, the software on the target. The target is the, uh, the embedded um, system that we are actually building. So you have the, the bootloader here that kickstarts the Linux kernel, and then applications can be started and they either um, directly talk to the C library. Yes, the C library is the interface to the Linux kernel. So when you open a file, for example, that's a system call, you make it through the C library. You're supposed to do that this way. So all the system calls are actually accessed. All the, the services of the system are actually accessed through uh, the C library. But you, of course, you can go through intermediate libraries uh, like um, image decoding and um, whatever library, um, database access and things like that. Uh, and then access the C library, but that's how the applications can be structured. So next, uh, so how to build the cross compiling tool chain. Sorry, so a, a tool chain is a compiler, right? Uh, essentially um, that from the same source code can either, if you if you have an AT tool chain, you generate an x86 binary. So some code that runs on your PC. But if you uh, take the same source code like hello.c, you with a cross compiling tool chain uh, for uh, like for the RISC five target, you generate some binary that will work that will run uh, on a different execution machine, which is a RISC five in that case. But that can be ARM, of course, or something else. So uh, why would we generate our own cross compiling tool chain? Um, well. Compared to ready-made tool chains, you can choose your exact compiler version. As we saw, uh, you can choose your C library, like uh, glibc, uclibc, muscle. I'll say a few words about the C libraries. You can also tweak other features um, and, of course, fix bugs. So in case you find a bug and find a fix for that bug, you just apply a fix to that bug and regenerate the tool chain, keeping everything the same. So. This uh, avoids to, to get another tool chain that might have different bugs. So you don't hear you're not uh, going anywhere in terms of uh, stability if you switch to another tool chain. So it's here it's nice in terms of reproducibility and stability. Uh, one of the choices when you build a tool chain is to choose the right C library. So um, it's an essential component of the system, as I said, it's the interface between um, the applications and the system. So the, the system call interface is actually accessed, supposed to be accessed through the C library, right? Uh, and of course it allows to, um, it's not only an interface, it also allows to implement uh, C programs in a higher level than implementing everything by yourself. So in the, in the case of embedded, you have two, uh, three essential types of uh, libraries. Uh, there's glibc that is found on the desktop, uh, and is also use, useful and embedded, but it's relatively big um, in our standards, like two megabytes is big for me, especially when I write on a boot time project, I want the code to be as small as possible so that it loads faster and then the system is up faster. Uh, a very popular library in uh, the embedded space is the uclibc. Um, it, it does support RISC-V uh, 64, but the last time I checked, so I didn't check with the latest version of uh, build root, but it didn't support. Uh, it wasn't supported by build root to make a tool chain yet. I, I, especially, I mean, I mean on RISC five uh, sixty four. Uh, I'm not talking about ARM. And the so that the other one that's supported by build root to make a tool chain is the muscle C library, which is more recent, and it is also very uh, very nice. It's used in the Alpine Linux distribution, for example. So it's a uh, it's it's very solid and and ready to use as well. So why, why I'm um, telling you all this is, is because you may need to choose the C library at, uh, at the time you create the cross compiling tool chain, uh, because the uh, GCC compiler is compiled against a specific C library and um, it knows about that C library when it, it needs to know about that C library when compiling programs. So that's, you have to, we have to make the choice now. Ah, my VLC is out of frame. Yeah, sometimes it is. Hopefully uh, the presentation is still all right. 
Okay, so um, again, what we did in Bitroot is to download the sources, extract them, you run menu config, you choose the target architecture, and choose your C library, and just run make SDK, as I told you. At the end, what you have is in output images is um, uh, just a tar the GZ uh, file containing the tool chain that you can uh, expand anywhere on your on your system. Uh, but the, the thing is, tool chains contain some hard coded directories. So uh, there's a script that's provided by Buildroot uh, that's called relocate SDK that you just run uh, in the uh, in the place where you extracted the direct the, the tool chain, and that will just make take the current directory and fix up the tool chain to adapt this. So this. The, what I did was actually recorded through ASCII NEMA, if you want to have a look. It's actually uh, a way to record, in case you don't know that, it's a nice way to record a text videos, so ASCII videos. Well, everything is just ASCII. <laughs> so it's, uh, look at that. And like, if I want to pause this, I can pause, and actually you can copy paste for the video. So I hope you like this. If, if, if you're new to that, just try ASCII NEMA. It's a way to record your ASCII sessions in a kind of uh, video that you can then share with people. So here, the nice thing is being able to copy paste from videos, like copying, copy pasting the address of uh, the Bilrota archive. That's isn't that nice? I love the, I love this one. So you you can see the sequence uh, I went through, and in terms of of size is of course so much nicer than a real video. <laughs> so just a series of strokes uh, re being replayed in that uh, nice uh, nice interface. There you are. So don't hesitate to use that. Okay. Now back to the presentation. Um, let's check where we are. Oh, sorry, that's what I meant. Yes. Resize this. Yes. Um, I just wanted to exit this actually. Uh, so see where the tool chain is. Okay, still still running, still progressing. That's good. So um, once you have your tool chain, we you can test it. So I I, I propose to create um, a risk 564 environment file that I can source when I want to uh, use the tool chain and compile my program my project so i'm just adding the path to the tool chain here where i extracted it uh, to the path um, and then i can i, I can test um, my my uh, my binaries and see uh, whether I make sure my, my my cross compiler and make sure i can actually um, compile a file a hello.c file and check that it's the right architecture here Right, so here you'll see that it's effectively uh, risk five um, statically linked because I use minus static. So it, here it's self-sufficient and uh, it doesn't rely on shared libraries. So it, it's actually easy to, um, to test your executable with QMU risk five uh, 64, which just emulates the instruction set. It doesn't need to emulate an entire machine. And since we don't have shared libraries, we're just good to go. So my slides are ahead of me, uh, of the, the actual run. Uh, a few words about the hardware emulator. So we are using QMU. Um, uh, I chose to actually use uh, QMU 5.x because it probably has new features. But I think for, for, this, for the manipulations I'm showing, um, QMU 4.x is probably good enough as well. So just in case you want to try, uh, you're using Ubuntu I, as I do, uh, you want to use uh, for uh, QMU for PyDotX, just install it. It's the default version on, uh, on Ubuntu 2010. But on 2004, you would, you need to get the software from a special PPA, like a personal archive, package archive. So you'll get it this way. Oops. And you can check which machines are supported by, um, the, by, the, by QMU. So QMU system architecture actually supports and emulates an entire system, not only a CPU, but a, a set of uh, devices. And the very nice thing about QMU is that it just runs the same kernels as the 
as the kernels that support the real hardware. So that's, I mean, from my, my experience, it's almost always this case. So uh, for ARM, for example, I'm just booting, um, when I booting an emulated machine, I just compiled a normal kernel uh, for the real machine and just boot it with QMU and it just, it just works. So here we have a, a bunch of machines that are emulated. So there's the Sci-5 machines, which I didn't mention, but these are the, um, um, they are, these are some boards that are not uh, um, sold anymore. Uh, that, that, that were actually the, the first boards based on um, a Sci-5 SOC. So I should have mentioned them in the list. They, they, are, they, they are actually a company not really making SOCs, but uh, designing uh, SOCs uh, for, 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 for people to use them in products. Uh, if I understand correctly, the microchip one is based on a Sci-5 uh, core or something derivative, uh, derivative from it. There's um, a Spike board. It's, uh, I didn't try that one. Uh, I know Spike is an emulator as well. And there's the, the, the Vert board. Uh, so it's a, a virtual board based on a virtual I.O. devices. So um, you don't have real uh, uh, peripherals in, the, in this one, but it's easy to, to emulate. So let's see where we are now. Ah, yeah. Uh, getting close. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, so, uh, yes, I have to say a few things too about the way to boot um, RISC-V, which is a bit bit more specific. Uh, if you're coming from ARM, it's a bit surprising. So, uh, essentially, you have three uh, privilege modes that are defined uh, on RISC-V. You have the user mode, that's for applications. You have the supervisor mode, that's, the, uh, that's meant to use by the OS kernels. And then these, there's the uh, special machine mode, which is for the bootloader and firmware. Um, like if you're running, um, so M would be used like for simple embedded systems, like the bare metal ones, uh, which don't have like, it's just, you're just running code, like a uh, good old, uh, yeah, uh, bare metal software, right? Um, and that's used, yes, for the, for the very first uh, parts that, that you run on your machine at boot time, and, and in particular, uh, at least when you're booting a complex OS. Uh, so that that that's the first stage that you need actually some some M or M mode code that will kickstart uh, eventually um, an operating system like like here. Um, either you boot to boot eventually Linux, and like and then of course well, so that's the operating system um, mode. Let's say yes, kernel mode. And of course, then you can run uh, unprivileged operations, uh, applications uh, in the operating system. So you have three typical scenario here. Um, M is um, only M, so it's for simple embedded systems, bare metal ones. M and U, um, it's a variant of that. So uh, embedded systems with memory protection between the various processes. And uh, the more classic ones for us, at least, M, S and U, so it's a uh, Unix-like operating systems with virtual memory as, as yes, as Linux will be. So let's see if my toolchain building is over now. Ah, oh, not yet, okay. Oh, it's building some busy box, that's weird. Well, we'll see, um, maybe it needs some of it. So let's move on, let's go on a little bit more. and see. So now uh, the next step is to build the Linux kernel. So I'm going to come to that soon. Uh, hoping my tool chain creation is over now. And so how to build a compiler Linux kernel. Essentially, you uh, you need to, to define, to get the Linux kernel sources, of course, um, specify the target architecture. So that's where the uh, code specific um, the architecture specific code will be found like where the architecture specific headers will be found, uh, where the uh, uh, hardware specific code will be found. So it corresponds to um, a directory, the arch setting corresponds to a subdirectory in the Linux kernel sources under arch, right? So you, you define the arch um, environment variable, you can run, um, you can then configure your kernel to select the features you want uh, the kernel to be compiled. So you have a reference configuration you can apply, and then you can um, run make menu config and select your features. And now you're ready to cross 
to cross compile the kernel if you if you if you are cross compiling so here you um, you set uh, the cross compile environment variable which is actually the prefix to your cross compiler so if your cross compiler is grid 564 linux dash gcc then the, um, the the, the, the cross compiler prefix is everything before GCC in the name. That, that's how it's, it's done because uh, the Linux kernel make file is going to invoke um, cross compile GCC. And then you can run make and you have your, um, your kernel binary that's ready. Then you can also install modules with make modules install or um, install the kernel with make install or do a manual copy. So I hope my uh, compiling is over because we may be getting late otherwise. Oh yes, that was a bit slower than expected. Okay. So um, let me, oh, I forgot to copy actually a hello.c file. Let me get one. Oh, I can actually copy it, I think. So let me uh, do that in another window that you won't see. Oh, you may see, I don't know. Uh, so. Okay. Yes, you see it, okay. Uh, so cp uh, hello.c to my machine. So I'm using two machines actually to Ah, okay, well, no, right, wrong syntax, my mistake. Ah, okay, I didn't install the SSH server, just a minute. Um, if I can find the right window, yeah, yeah, so. That's the one thing I forgot to prepare <laughs> for this talk. <laughs> okay, good. Right, so now the copy should work. Okay, not yet. Okay, let's make a manual copy then. That's life. Just a minute. Okay, yeah, right. there we are. So back to the window. Uh, yeah. So uh, so the first thing I, I said uh, I need to do is to extract the two chain. So I'm gonna be here in two chain, for example. Well, actually in uh, risk five, let's do that this way. Two chain. I'm going to extract the two chain. So it's in uh, build root, output images, right? So it's in this, um, and as I said, there's a relocate SDK, SH command, right? Okay, good. Uh, so you see in uh, bin, you have all the executables here, uh, corresponding to the toolchain. Okay, so I get back to risk five, and I'm gonna say what I, um, sorry, hey. I'm, um, I'm going to create an environment file, so let's, let's actually grab it from the slides. Like this one. Right. 
So that's something I'm going to source every time I need my tool chain. Right, so I, I source that. What? Okay. Okay, and now we can try to compile. Oh yes, uh, hello, the hello.c program and see. So it's called Rix5 uh, Linux uh, GCC. So static, it's easier, minus uh, oh, hello, and hello.c and see what we get. Hello, yes. So it's a Rix5 statically um, it's linked. I can actually try to execute it now with QMU, as I said, QMU in user mode. And it works, right. So now it's time to um, to quickly get the Linux kernel, otherwise we may be late. It takes a bit of time to compile it. So kernel, you get it that from kernel.org. Here's the one. Yes. I like to copy and paste, copy the link location to the from the browser to the uh, terminal. That's easier. It, it's a, it's sad that they they're shipping the release candidates only in GZ um, tardy GZ mode, so it's a bit like slower to extract. To download and extract. So now there's a I'm extracting the kernel sources, and now I'm getting back to the slides. So I actually need to set uh, the two things I told you, like cross compile and and arch. I'm gonna add those. Oh, sorry. I can copy and paste while while I am in um, full screen mode. Right, so just need this. There we are. So I'm going to solve that again. Now I can go inside the Linux kernel sources and I'm going to apply the default environment. So I'm just doing that right here to make that config. And compile uh, it quickly with make minus a8 so it's gonna run for five minutes or something like that so um in this I, i'll have time to explain what i'm doing so yeah that was already explained so yes you can see the available configurations um, the Linux kernel gives you some ready-made configurations for various boards or various socs so here just, you can just run make help grab dev config and you'll see the default ones. Except the, those two, like um, save dev config uh, is a special one, all dev config and all dev config are, are special ones. But otherwise, you have like um, support for the Kendrite 210 uh, board uh, in two different modes, uh, plus the RV32 uh, one, which I don't really know. But at least I checked with the default one for uh, Risk Five, and it just works. So that's what I did. And we could further customize the configuration with make menu config, which actually we don't need here because it's just fine. So we run make to compile or make minus J like J like jobs. It runs multiple jobs at the same time uh, because compiling the kernel is just like turning lots of .c files into .o files. So that can be parallelized massively. You can even recompile, if you keep your time, keep like you keep recompiling the kernel over and over again, you can also use C cache. It's a compiler cache that also makes it even faster to recompile uh, the kernel over and over again. So you, you could use that too as a nice trick. At the end, you get um, two files. Essentially, well, the, um, the, the compiled kernel in ELF format. So that's something you can feed to a debugger. That's not ready to be executed, but that can be fed to the, the, the debugger. And then you have uh, in Arch, uh, Rift 5 boot. You have image, uh, there's an incom uncompressed kernel, and image.gz, 
that's the compressed kernel you can boot. Well, you could boot image as well, uh, but it's nice to have the compressed kernel. It's sometimes faster to load. Let's see. Let, oh, sorry, no, not, not this. That's the, what I want here. So let's see how it looks like on the, on the kernel side. Uh, kernel combining could be over. Not yet. Yeah, it takes a bit of time. So the next thing we need here is to actually compile the uh, the firmware because you can't, unlike on, uh, on on ARM, you can directly boot the Linux kernel from QMU. Um, it doesn't work. You you it's because you're switch. You have to switch. You have to start the machine in uh, machine mode first, and then jump to uh, S mode. Uh, so this is done by some special software. Some special by some special firmware. So there are various projects. The last time I used another one like BBL, Berkeley Bootloader. Uh, now I'm using OpenSBI. Um, so that, uh, that, that's what you need to use here. Uh, so you, um, and the, yes, the SBI allows it effectively to boot from M mode to S mode. That's, a, that's a, it's called Open Supervisor Binary Interface. So the SBI is a, is a standardized way of uh, invoking uh, an OS from the supervisor. So you 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 clone that actually from this project, and you when you make it actually you you um, you include um, you kind of embed the um, the S mode image that you want to build like the the kernel binary that you want to execute. So the um, at the end what you get is um, a firmware payload. So like the firmware the firmware code plus the payload which is the Linux kernel. Uh, which is then a binary that the that QMU can boot, uh, which is not possible, uh, unlike on ARM. Uh, to it, again, it's not possible to boot the kernel directly from QMU. So to boot the kernel now, uh, we're going to use uh, QMU, right? So uh, passing those options, so passing just the minus kernel and the payload here and the, the console, right? Uh, some console setting to, to tell the Linux kernel. That's an argument to the Linux kernel here um, to, um, to de redirect the booting messages to the right place. So let's see, I hope it's over now because I was a bit optimistic in the, the time it was taking to compile. Maybe the, the thing is probably because I'm using the camera, it slowed down uh, compiling. So that, that's probably the reason why. Anyway, I can, uh, I can move on um, explaining things about the root file system. So, Here, uh, when you, you boot your, your board, it, you'll see the kernel booting, but at the end, it will panic because it doesn't have a root file system yet. And that's what we're going to fail. So um, that's the next step. And, and by the way, if you start QMU, um, I was, we were told, uh, we were uh, shared that information with one of our, par our participants to our courses. Um, uh, you can actually interrupt QMU with Control A followed by Control X. So it's very convenient to stop QMU. Um, before that, I had to kill it from another window, which was really inconvenient. So uh, to build the root file system, we're going to use um, some software that's called BusyBox. So 10 years ago, it was implementing all those commands, which was already nice. But now, whoops, it's even, even more. So all the commands you may dream of uh, in your scripts, essentially, uh, in the command, command line scripts that you would start uh, in your machine. Like, uh, yeah, everything you need is there. So to, to download BusyBox, you create a root file system and installation directory. You download the sources. I'm going to show you that. And you extract the archive. And then you add, um, uh, I start by selecting nothing. So I, I prefer to have like a minimum set of, uh, of uh, applets. Applet is the commands that uh, BusyBox supports. And then uh, by running make, when you config, you can choose to build a static binary. You can choose to pass the cross compiler prefix. That's in the configuration this time. And, uh, and then uh, you can choose where to install BusyBox, so like in our rootfs directory, and then we select the um, commands that we want to execute. So um, I hope the kernel compiling is over. It's not. <laughs> OK. Well, actually, I can prepare the, uh, the QMU emulation uh, here, the QMU script, to save a bit of time. And I, I also need to compile OpenSBI. I forgot about that. So. So 
let me open a new tab. I'm going to call it QNU. All right, so let's see this file. So I'm exceeding the 45 minutes, I'm sorry. Uh, right. I make that executable. Okay. Uh, I need to compile OpenSBI too. So I need to clone, to clone that. There we are. Well, I don't have the uh, kernel binary yet, but it's coming soon. Right? Yeah, that's the next kernel. Hey, come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's the camera that slowed down things a bit. Uh, let me go through, go through the slides anyway, so there's never any waste of time. So yes, we'll, we'll eventually populate uh, the, the root file system with BusyBox. So when you install BusyBox, um, you see that actually the, um, there's only one executable that's here, uh, BusyBox, which is a, it fits in 30, uh, 300K here. Um, and all the other executables are links to BusyBox. So when you invoke, for example, mount, um, it's actually BusyBox that gets called, but it, it checks its uh, its name. So it's in, if it's invoked with the mount name, it knows that it should behave as mount. That's that's how it works. So that's what happens when you run make install. So uh, I find it quite funny because uh, we're actually using a 64-bit system to boot a 300 kilobyte um, program, to run a, a 300 kilobyte program. So I find it funny. Now, um, and then we can put that in a, in a file system, uh, in a file system image. So we create an empty file with uh, one megabyte size. So one block of one megabyte, so it's one megabyte. We format it as if it was a real partition. We can format a file, um, a file system image. And then we mount, we actually create a mount point. We mount it with minus O loop. It's a way to mount um, a disk image in a file uh, to a mount point, and then we can uh, populate the content, what was installed with this box, we can replicate that in the, in the mounted image. And every time we make an update to that, we just run sync. So uh, let's go here. Um, I hope that the kernel compiling is over. Yes, it is. Good. So you see it, it, it did create my image.gz, as I said, as I promised. So now, um, oh yeah, I should have copied the command because I don't remember it by heart. That's the one I want. Copy. Ah, uh, yes, that should be right. Nope. Ah, uh, maybe because I... Ooh, why are next? Well, that's weird. Okay, uh, they source the environment, maybe not. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, it's the, it's the wrong environment. <laughs> um, it's this, this machine is still configured for ARM, I, I believe, make it clean. It's going to be better. Yes. Right, so now I can. I'll be ready to run QMU. Yeah, the payload.elf uh, file is created. So now I can try to run QMU. Okay. Ah, yes. Yeah, so okay, I haven't installed it yet. So, well, let's do that without uh, uh, misc. I think it's QMU misc. Now. Let's see my notes. Well, let's do 
uh, yeah, QMU system misc. I think that's enough. So I'll, I'll, I'll use this one, QMU system misc, without having to use a special PPA. So it supports, it's the uh, emulation of the various systems that are supported by QMU. And this will confirm that Q QMU4 does work. Yeah, so it's booting, you see the, the bootloader? Ah, but not more. <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, maybe I need to use, uh, so to use the QMU5. Indeed. Yeah, I'm missing. And this one. Okay. It's going to be uh, installing QMU5 now. I just want to show that the kernel boots at least, because <laughs> we 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 are we are very slow, uh, very very slow, but very close. Okay, can you? Ah no, so I must have done something wrong in there. Um, but I don't know exactly what. Compared to the multitude so many times, I, I actually ran it. Open is it open SBI here. Well, okay, well, never mind. Um, the instructions are supposed to work. Uh, if, I, if there's something that needs fixing, I'll figure out and, and fix the instructions. It's a bit of time to, to wrap up anyway. Um, so um, there we are. So you can just follow the instructions. Uh, apologies for this. I, I under, underestimated the time to build the toolchain. So uh, if you follow this, we can then create a device directory to see all our devices. Uh, we add mounting of, of proc and sys, uh, and then we can start some uh, scripts automatically using a, a busybox init, um, which allows to specify some uh, scripts to be run at boot time. So that's how it works. And then we can even start a um, an, an HTTP interface. So we're setting up networking between QMU and the target, uh, QMU and our host here. So we're adding some net networking capabilities uh, like, like this. Uh, and then you can uh, go to, uh, you I can add um, a simple um, script here that's going to be evaluated by the BusyBox HTTP server, um, showing you the uptime of your system. So that's a way to interact with your machine with an HTTP server. So you could just go there, um, visit the link, and you're good to go. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I, I'll fix what uh, I'll fix what was wrong in the command I typed. Uh, it just was working all the time. Um, so the next steps, uh, what I wanted to do is actually start booting Linux from, uh, from your boot instead of directly from um, the firmware. And I was I, actually, I'm close. Uh, just a bit disappointing because I wanted to really to show you uh, U-Boot as well. Um, so I, I actually reported that to the uh, software development uh, mailing list um, for, for RISC-5. So I, I, I'm explaining what works. So what works is this, uh, you, you, you were supposed to see. Um, and then trying to boot uh, with U-Boot uh, and then Linux. And this just works at the beginning. But when I start the kernel, um, I end up uh, with uh, some some errors here uh, after adding the right debugging messages. So it's it kind of starts, but then boom, um, <laughs> something is wrong. So I, I still need to investigate that. But then in the next version of this talk, I'll be able to show both U-Boot and, uh, um, and, 
and the Linux kernel. I mean, the Linux kernel being started from eBoot. So what to remember, uh, embedded Linux is easy. It makes it easier to, to get started with Linux. Just a few steps and you're good to go. You have a, a command line, believe me, you didn't see that, sorry, but it's there. Uh, it's just a few steps um, away from, uh, yeah, just a few things to type and you're good to go. Um, RISC five is a new open instruct instructions uh, instruction set architecture. You sh you, I really invite you to uh, use it and support it. And the nice thing about investing in embedded Linux knowledge is that things don't change so much over time. So you just get more features, more more hardware, more 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 possibilities. So to to finish that, I highly recommend to to have a look at Drew's presentation about. Uh, the latest presentation at uh, about uh, risk price so so many aspects uh, hardware uh, introduction to the platform the hardware uh, how to make your own um, it's it's a, just a an unmatchable presentation I, it's so crystal, crystal clear I'm amazed how drew can uh, cover uh, so many aspects in, in less than an hour uh, unlike me as you see uh, so uh, if you want to know more about embedded Linux 2 you can go uh, and uh, check our Free available slides about embedded Linux, um, and you have only presentations and conference presentations from Bootlink here. And uh, last but not least, you have the embedded Linux wiki, where uh, you have a bunch of resources on all types of uh, aspects. So, and so, if you're looking for a platform where to share your knowledge or where to learn from as well, you could use this one. Right. Thank you. Sorry for the. Over time, <laughs> thanks, Geert. <laughs> See you. Uh, thanks you. Thank you all. Um, so uh, I don't know where, where I can stay and and ask question if I'm allowed. Um, any maker board instead of QMU? Uh, there some are coming. Uh, cannot say more. Uh, so. You just look at Drew's presentation. You'll have like interesting uh, boards that are coming up in the next, uh, either at the end of this year or um, uh, early ne next year. So there's there would be a lot to, um, to to work with. Yeah, you'll have a. Oh yeah, Yocto can be used as well. It supports um, asking a, a question, answering a question from Joao. You can use Yocto, of course. Uh, just Yocto is slower, so it doesn't fit in 45 minutes, at least for the first run. That's the reason why. But yes, of course, you can use it. <laughs> in 45 hours. <laughs> yeah. The one is just thirteen dollars, so it's really nice. It's um great to 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 hack. Uh, thanks to remind us through. Uh, I tried. Yeah, hi, Christian. Uh, I tried um, CrossLNG. Um, well, I haven't tried recently. Um, I guess it just just works. Well, it's it, it, CrossLNG is a tool to generate two chains and only that, so it does it very well. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ru, for the for the link. Yes, Murat, uh, I, I agree. They have a bias towards build root. <laughs> yeah, I'm not completely neutral here. Oh, but I, I don't always use build root like um, as, I, as I should uh, when I need to um, uh, root my system to boot my system with. I just get busy box, uh, menu config, um, and just um, install a few a few executables I need and. Um, and then and, and compile my kernel, and then I have something to boot my kernel with. I, I don't use build root for like, like this. Like so, if if you once you get familiar with that, you can quickly in a matter of minutes you can get a root file system uh, with some default commands and boot on that file system. You don't even need build root. Uh, okay, okay, a question from Selva, Selva Kumar. Uh, jumping straight into device driver development for RISC five boards uh, is it a good idea? Um, well, you, if you have a board that boots, uh, I would say yes. Uh, if you don't have to mess up with the understanding how to the, uh, um, how to boot that that particular kernel, uh, you have a kernel up and running, then you can add drivers. That that's 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 more than welcome. Effectively, that 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 will broaden the support for uh, for the architectures we want to support. So I would say yes, and uh, the Linux kernel do, does its best to keep the architecture-specific details uh, hidden. So yes, you can go and, and and try to implement driver development for RISC-V boards, especially if 
the initial uh, support for the board is already already there. Ah, there's a yet there's a new link about Bitroot. Ah, yeah, okay, for for building it with uh, for, for for the for the key two hundred and ten. Yeah, good. Well, so I'm really excited about the progress of Rick 5 um, It's going to change lots of things, so you'll be able to make your own. Uh, you can participate to open source projects for SOCs or for FPGAs. That's that's really exciting. So, um, well, thanks thanks for your particip participation to this talk. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, to use my email to send questions to me. Right. Well, thank you guys to, for participating, ladies and, and guys. <laughs> and we can stay on the chat for a while if it's possible. Well, thanks again. And goodbye. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>